righty, here we go. It's the Travis Neville Podcast. My name is Travis Neville. Um, I wrote this book here called The Jocelyn Method. You can get it every damn where. I recommend you check out travisneville.com. You can buy decals. You can get the book. You can get my podcast t-shirts and uh, all that stuff. More to come. Uh, still working on the new book. My, my goal is to have it in the box by Christmas, which... Uh, means that I'm done uh, writing it and doing my own internal edits and at that point I will then turn it over of course to the publisher let them start doing the editing that they want to do and and you know that that uh, you know that that process usually takes a couple of months and then you know the goal is to have it out by spring so that's what we're hoping for um, let's see what I've been up to uh, been up north a lot been working a lot I think it's gonna be a situation where I move up there next year uh, just because, you know, my business, my recruiting business is remote, so I can do that anywhere, and, um, you know, I have an opportunity to do some more construction work up there, and it could be full-time, and I've been enjoying it, you know, it's, it's been a lot of fun, so why not, plus, I mean, I just don't like living near a big city, you know, I'm in the suburbs of Detroit, and no thanks, <laughs> you know, <laughs> Southeast Michigan, just... Too many people, too many problems. Uh, no thanks. I, I just like it up there better. Slower pace, fewer people, fewer problems. Anyway, that's the plan. So today I want to talk about. You know, I'm, I'm going to title this podcast. I'm going to call it the whistle. But uh, it came to me as a as an idea as I was listening to um, to the the Ryan Mickler podcast. Uh, he was talking to a guy and and they were talking about these kinds of things that I'm going to get into today. And it just occurred to me that uh, what role sort of the whistle plays in your life as a man. Um, I would tell you, know, I'm going to start start here. Let's. Uh, so you know, we, we've we've talked about this before that there are, you know, hundreds of thousands of years of human evolution and uh, survival of the fittest that has made you as a man uh, what you are, and and there are things that are within you that um, you can't restrain. If you do, you're looking for problems down the road. I talk all the time about the idea that, um, you know, if you have an issue that's something that's bothering you about something maybe that's going on in your relationship or something that's going on w at work, the the worst thing you can do is to, to smash it down and say, you know what, I, I can handle that. I'll be fine. I'll be fine. I can handle that because it'll end up leaking out somewhere else. It'll end up coming out in places that it shouldn't. Um, these guys that was talking on the Mickler podcast today, he was talking about what he calls a victim puke. And I'm going to back up and, and tell you kind of where that comes from. This is what I'm talking about. So you are, if you are not as agreeable, not as disagreeable, I suppose, as you should to be really successful, in the world, uh, and when you, when I talk about agreeability, that's one of the five primary personality traits that uh, Jordan Peterson talks about. But you you basically owe it to the world to, if a thing is bothering you, you've got to say it. You've got to get it out of you and say, you know what, you've got to have the balls to confront a person or a situation and say, hey, you know what, I didn't like that, and and here's what I didn't like about it. Um, you know, that's an uncomfortable conversation. But if you don't have it. Like I said, that tension, the thing that is bothering you, you cannot swallow that down. It will pop out somewhere else later, and it'll come out inappropriately. It'll come out in traffic, or you'll you'll get angry at your wife about where she puts her shoes, or something like that. So that has got to come out. All right. So if if you don't, that 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 idea of it comes coming out in a victim puke. Uh, that that's what it is. Essentially, what you're doing is you're creating these. Uh, these these covenants you're, you're creating these agreements with other people uh, and you're like I'm doing everything I I'm supposed to do in this environment in this relationship and you're not handling your end but you're not sharing that with the other person and there's the problem right so you're making an agreement you're assuming they know what their portion of of the agreement is but you haven't talked about it so they don't and then you get mad at them when they don't fulfill their end of the the agreement <laughs> you, know? you know I was dating this girl real nice girl and uh, she was living at my house and and uh, I'm like you know everything's going fine I wasn't around much and uh, and then I ended up trying to get a hold of her on the phone one day and it took me all day and I couldn't get a hold of her so the next day uh, I ended up sending her this text and saying 
hey, I need you to do this at the house, do this at the house, do this at the house, and help me in this way, and help me in this way, and help me. In this way. And I was really an asshole about it. And what that was, that was a victim puke. That was me. I never told her from the beginning, hey, here are some things that I need you to do to help out around the house. And uh, instead, I just got really angry that she wasn't doing it, even though I hadn't asked her to. So, you know, do you see where that's that's in, that's inappropriate, and it's not going to help you. You just come off looking like a fucking asshole. You, you got to be able to just have those conversations earlier. And I had been like, well, it's just nice having her around. It's no big deal. Uh, you know, I can handle this stuff myself. You know, and uh, you know, I can I can pay for the toilet paper and the lotion and the, the toothpaste and laundry soap and and the electricity and like I can handle all that. It's no problem. But I couldn't. You know what I mean? I needed to. I should have said from the beginning, hey, listen, I want you to stay here. That'll be really cool. But I need you to do these things, and I didn't. And it came out in, as a victim puke, which I think is a really cool term. But uh, anyway, that concept, all right, of not uh, getting out the things that you need, not, uh, you know, giving the other person in the relationship, whether it be a rom romantic one or a friendship or a work relationship or whatever that situation might be, not giving that person an insight into this deal that you're making with them, not letting them know that, hey, this is what I expect of you, that's going to be a problem. For you, you'll end up having a problem because you don't give them a heads up on that. You see what I'm saying? So now that you have that kind of basis, let's talk more about the whistle. What I mean by the whistle is this. Uh, you know, it's it's fall, and it that's football season. And you watch any football game, you're going to find some extremely violent actions, some hitting, some wrapping up, full speed runs, collisions, um, people doing things at a very high rate of intensity, but when the whistle blows, they stop, all right? And that whistle I find to be a much bigger concept than just what it means in sports, okay? And, and here's where I'm going with this. Um, when you look at, let's go big first. MMA fighters. You know, I'm a big MMA fan. There was a good card last weekend, Saturday night. Some really good fights. I really enjoyed watching. I was watching with my buddy up north. We had a great time. And, um, you know, these guys, they are engaging in the most violent of sports, the most violent of things that a, a man can do. But when they feel that tap or when the referee yells it's over or grabs him and pulls him off, um, they stop. They stop. They're they are at their they're at a ten as far as intensity of violence and aggression. But when that whistle blows, they turn it off. All right, and that's not an accident. That's not just oh they just know when to stop. Um, you know these guys are pretty pretty violent dudes. They have that in them. You see what I'm saying? But the reason why they can do that is because they've practiced doing that. I think you'll find that a lot of these guys, I mean, some of them are, you know, from the streets of, streets of Brazil and shit like that, and I don't know what it's like there, but here in the U.S., the American fighters, fuck, most of these guys when they were young, they were they were wrestlers, you know, they, they wrestled competitively, and, and they were, they would stop at the whistle, they learned to stop at the whistle, they learned what the whistle meant, it's, uh, it's a concept that I love because it's so well adhered to by the most dangerous of people, and I use that term kind of loosely, the most, the guys with the most potential for, for danger, right? They're able to do that. Well, again, how does that happen? Well, you got to practice it, okay? And we are not as a culture, okay, in general. At the high levels like that, sure we are. But when I look at schools, for example, um, you know, elementary schools, and all the way up, really, I think education as a whole is uh, incredibly restrictive for boys. I think that uh, schools in general, without realizing it, are trying to systemically delete boyhood and thus manhood. Um, and they, you know, that's done by constantly blowing the whistle on natural boyish things, uh, wrestling around, playing running around, getting excited, being competitive. Um, these things are getting deleted from schools. I mean, shit, I was a... I can remember being a teacher in 2004, and you, you, couldn't, you couldn't play dodgeball anymore because, oh, you might hurt somebody's feelings. People get 
you know, they get uh, excluded. Like you get, you lose that game. Everyone loses except for like one person, basically. Um, so dodgeball became not a thing you could do. My minor's in PE, so I taught some PE classes. And yeah, I remember dodgeball going away and I was thinking, eh, that doesn't seem right. I mean, we should have a place where, you know, competition, which is extreme, you know, it's, 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 it's ingrained in you as a man to be competitive. I mean, it's just as simple as, I was writing a chapter on competition for the book. It's as simple as, uh, you know, how to get get the girl. I mean, guys from the beginning, you know, again, hundreds of thousands of years ago, you were having to compete for sexual access to, to women. And most men young, and boys see that as still a thing they're doing. I mean, you can watch, you can look at any school you want to. And an all-boys school is going to be different than a school with girls. Boys are going to act differently with girls around. And I'm not saying that's good or bad. Uh, but the presence of girls means boys change the behavior. I mean, it's, it's as simple as what, you know where I used to work coaching football. We would bring girls into the weight room uh, for lots of reasons. The girls usually were great students. Like they, were, they would do everything you taught them, and they would do it really well in the weight room because they, you know, girls walk in there going, Oh my God, this big room full of all these big, strong boys. And I'm trying to lift weights with them. So they really put pressure on themselves to do it right. And as a result, they did it very, very well. And guys are a little more loosey goosey about that. But when they're around, when the guys are seeing the girls doing it right, it brings up the game for the guys. Like the guys get better, right? So all that I'm kind of beating around the bush here, but what's happening in schools is this competition is being discouraged. Uh, exclusive activities are being discouraged. Uh, recess is going away, a place where boys could go and run it all out, get all that shit out of them, get, get all that, you know, that activity out of them, those things that, that boys want to do and girls, uh, schools are deleting them. I mean, shit, there are lots of elementary schools now, especially private schools that don't even have recess because I guess academically it's looked at as, as a non-academic thing, recess, but I would tell you, I mean, that's no different than... Me working out first thing in the morning. I get all that energy out of me. I get all that power out of me, all that aggression out of me, and then I can be chilled out and focused and grind for the rest of the day. I mean, it still works for me, and it's it's really still for kids. It's even worse. So as we take, as we try to, like I said, as we try to systematically take that that boyhood, and that manhood, that natural uh, aggressiveness and excitement, and physicality and competition out of boys, we are essentially setting ourselves up for a victim puke situation so what happens there is well i can't be a boy boyishness is is discouraged and i'm not allowed to do that so i don't know what to do with myself now so then you end up with a purpose void and in worst case scenario you end up in a suicide situation where guys are just i don't know where i fit i don't know what i'm supposed to do everything that i want to do i can't and and it goes poorly. And then you, when you look at the numbers for suicide, I've said this before, uh, male suicide is 350% what female suicide is in the United States. It's, uh, it's pretty egregiously high. Um, so so that, that's the, one of the downsides. The other downside, like I said, you get that victim puke where, um, you know, I don't want to, uh, I can't be the thing I know I'm supposed to be. So I'm instead I'm going to um, act out. I'm going to be a... Uh, a negative piece of society. I'm going to move in that direction because it, it uh, at least I get to kind of tap into part of that aggressiveness, part of that uh, testing the limits that boys like to do. I was listening to a podcast between Jocko Willink and Jordan Peterson, and they were talking about this specifically. And uh, Jocko said that that if he didn't, if there were no, um, if there's nobody in the military who didn't test boundaries. Uh, there wouldn't be anybody in the military. Like these aren't military aren't the best kids that never made mistakes and always did everything right. That's usually not who's there. And he said, and that's what you need. You need people who are willing to do what needs to be done. And then Jordan Peterson starts talking about Harry Potter. And when you think about Harry and his and his crew of, of people, and I'm, and I'm only talking about the same reason Jordan did, uh, is that because it was such a phenomenon, it was such a big deal when that stuff first started coming out. Uh, they weren't the quote good kids. They weren't the bad kids either. They were the they were the good kids who were willing to break the rules when the rules needed to be broken. And so for that reason, they were extremely relatable. Because I believe that that's 
I mean, really who we all are, but certainly men. Uh, you, men are more inclined to believe in that Nietzschean philosophy of Ubermensch. And, and uh, if you get a chance, look into that. I'll give you a little bit of background. The Ubermensch is the man who understands the rules of society and adheres to them for the most part. But if he sees that it doesn't, that those those rules of society don't make any sense or that they are going to cause a situation where um you know i don't need to adhere to the rules now that i'm not going to hurt anybody and it, why not um for example there's this there's this stoplight on on thompson road and fenton road that isn't too far from my house and man that thing will be red for it seems like 15 minutes and there's especially in the middle of the night there is not a car you won't see anybody so i just look if, if it's safe i'm like, fuck it, I'm going, you know, and I just go through it. You know, that's the idea that, hey, nobody's going to be hurt by this. There's no reason why I can't just go through here. Um, and I would encourage you to, I guess, evolve to that to that level of understand, understanding the rules so well that you understand when they're misapplied. And you can, you can make that move and you can make that adjustment, right? So that was the uh, really cool conversation. Like, what you would think when you have Jacko Willink, this... Uh, super aggressive physical former navy seal like extreme ownership you know fuck you get your shit together guy and and jordan peterson who's super academic um certainly less um i guess i don't want to insult the guy because he's awesome but he's not that big physical presence you know what i mean he's more of an academic um he's uh just a, a thinker and and uh, to hear them discuss and, and find such common ground on things is pretty awesome um, anyway, they're, they're co the comment, of course, remember the idea that we're dealing with here is the whistle and how important it is. Um, and, and that's what, you know, Jacko said. He was talking about one of the reasons he liked the military and one of the things he thinks, one of the reasons why he thinks it's so good is you get the opportunity to be, and remember now he was a Navy SEAL. He keeps calling, he keeps calling himself a commando. He, you get the opportunity to go out and do really like violent, aggressive things that again that's in our dna as men but you're doing it for a very good cause and there's a whistle of sorts there's a structure to it there's a lot of structure in the military um, and there's a there's a mission and there's teamwork involved and we are ridding the world of evil and these are the things that you know you do when you're in the military these are the things that keep you motivated so these guys um you know navy seals you don't google Navy SEAL and street fight, you're probably not going to find it. I mean, these guys know that they're dangerous and they know that they're extremely, they know what they're capable of. And so they don't tap into that. They don't want to. They do it for work and they do it because it's part of their jobs. And then when they're not doing that, they don't have, they don't want any part of it. MMA guys, the same thing. I mean, you're not going to find an MMA guy in a street fight. I mean, it's extremely rare. Uh, guys who know what their potential is, guys who know that they have the ability to do a lot of damage, usually respect that. The guys who have tuned it, the guys who have learned how to harness it, manage it, and know how to shut it off at the whistle, they avoid it. Like Jacko even says, he's like, man, unless you hit me, unless you physically touch me, I'm going to try to get away from there. That's the safest move for both of us. I don't want any part of it. I don't want anything to do with it. I mean, unless you put your hands on me, then that's a different story. You know, that's that's what he talks about. And, um, yeah, I would say that that's, uh, you know, that's that's a key. And they also, they talk about this idea that, um, um, you know, this is Peterson talking. He says that a dangerous man is really one who is weak. Because what a weak man will do is he'll take, he'll try to, He's going to sucker punch you, essentially, and I don't just mean physically. I mean the guy at work who's weak and doesn't have any respect for himself and doesn't have any integrity. Uh, he's the guy who's going to go behind your back to the boss after you, you talked about a thing that maybe wasn't the best move. You guys were just shooting the shit, and he took it and used it against you because he wants to move up the ranks at your expense. That's what a weak man would do. A strong man would say, dude, I don't like that you did that. That's not. A, we're all on the same team here, and we got to be... Make sure we're on, we're on the same team here. You can't be, you know, um, stealing or cheating or whatever you're doing at work, right? Um, you have to watch out for the weak man. And they talk about the two of them that that a very, you know, 
a big physically, like an MMA fighter, somebody who's highly trained and physically capable of great violence is not a threat at all because he knows it and he knows how to control it. He knows how to stop at the whistle, right? Whereas these weak motherfuckers, they don't. And that's what makes them dangerous. They're the ones who are going to uh, get into the road rage shit. They're the ones who are going to, um, you know, stab you in the back. I mean, Brutus stabbing Caesar, right? He was fucking weak, man. If he'd uh, He should have confronted his friend one-on-one -on -one and not been a part of seven or eight dudes or however many stabbed him and when they killed him. You know, that was just uh, ridiculous and... It was weakness. It was weakness. It's the weak people that you have to worry about. So I'm always a proponent of, and I'm starting, this is from the very beginning, um, learn to tune your strength, learn to get good at it, whether it's mentally, I also recommend physically, uh, find some sort of a martial sport to be involved in. You know, I talk about that all the time, that uh, you know, if you're, you want to make sure that your, your boys are going to become men, you got to get them into some sort of martial sport. You've got to get them into boxing or MMA, football, wrestling, some place where they're going to learn how to use their physical violence and then it'll be controlled. They'll be able to stop it when they need to stop it. They'll be able to get out when they need to get out of it and move forward. You know what I mean? Like take your gear off and turn it off. That's a thing that you know, every every boy needs to learn from a young age because they're going to have these urges to, to be violent and like wrestle and compete. I guess that's violence the wrong word. They're going to want to compete. Um, let's wrestle and see who's the best wrestler. Let's race and see who's the best race. Let's see who can lift this heavy thing. And I'm going to compete against you, my friends or other people around. You know what I mean? Boys want to do that. And like I said, um, Schools are systematically taking that out. Essentially, I would tell you that public schools are trying to turn boys into girls. They're trying to turn everybody into girls. And I think that that's nobody specifically trying to do that, what I just said, but it's the outcome. And it's because generally elementary school teachers are women. Uh, middle school teachers are primarily women. High school, it's maybe half and half, but still mostly, usually mostly women. I mean, I taught at high schools and it was usually 40% guys and 60% women. But again, as you went down, and again, these are people, I'm not negative, I'm not uh, anti-teacher at all, for fuck's sake. I was a teacher for a long time, got a lot of friends who were teachers, my parents were both teachers. I'm just letting you know that that's what it is. I mean, you know, you tend to teach the things that you know. I mean, that's what it is. Like, you know, as an author, I was always told that the author is the first part of authority. You write about the things that that you're an authority on. Um, you, you share things, you, you teach things that you're an authority on. And how can a woman be an authority on, on what a boy, how a boy should act and how a boy becomes a man? That's extremely rare in women. It just is. Um, so that's what's happening. Uh, we, we are trying to, to eliminate boyhood. Um, we're trying to, which, which then weakens manhood which creates these weak men who then they are dangerous. It's, it's like, um, you know, I can remember in shop class, I mean, fuck, they don't even have shop class anymore. Probably. Right. Uh, Mr. Mr. Bonk was talking about, um, you know, his, his first day, he said, what's more dangerous, a really sharp tool or a really dull one. And you know, all the kids in the class, they answered, well, the, you know, the sharp one, it'll cut you deeper. It's super dangerous. You know? And he said, no, the dull, tool is far more dangerous because you have to put so much more pressure into it and it is so much less predictable. It could easily bounce out and you'll lose control of it and it'll go a place you don't want it to go. Whereas a sharp tool is very predictable and it'll do exactly what you think it's going to do. As long as you're smart with it, it's never going to hurt you. But the dull tools will. And I think that's a perfect uh, metaphor for what I'm talking about. Uh, the sharper your tool is, the less dangerous you become. It's like a uh, no different than than dogs. Now, with the difference between dogs and people, of course, is that uh, you know dogs don't have that frontal lobe like we do. They don't have that ability to logic and reason. They're just pure instinct. And uh, well, with loyalty and stuff in there too, you guys know what dogs are for Christ's sakes. But a really well trained, I would argue that a very well trained pit bull is safer than a very poorly trained Chihuahua. I mean, because a very well-trained pit bull, uh, very unlikely to be dangerous to you. Whereas a very poorly trained Chihuahua, even though it's much smaller, uh, those, those little fuckers are mean. <laughs> you know what I mean? And uh, 
it's a small dog, but it can do extreme damage to you. You know, it's still got the teeth and the claws and all that shit, right? And you might be able to grab it and break its neck and get it off you, but not before it puts its puts some injury on you. You know what I mean? Um, you see what I'm trying to say? Uh, sharpen your sword. Sharpen your teeth. Get yourself to where you understand what competition, conflict, even violence are. Get to where you understand all that, and then you can respect it, and it's never going to be a problem again. I mean, I would tell you that uh, the bad kids, the bad kids, um, I used to work with teachers who just would bitch. I had this teacher, she was like two rooms down from me, and she would bitch like crazy about having boys in class. Oh, it's all boys. We've got like 80% boys in that class, and you know how they are, blah, blah, blah. And she just didn't know how to handle them. <laughs> That's all it was. Like, just didn't know how to handle them. But uh, I would say that to her, you take the, the ringleader of, those, of the, all those boys and get him someplace where he can learn how to harness and utilize his ability to be competitive and excited and shit. You could easily in class just put him in charge of shit. You know, make him the guy and have him help you and put some re respect him by giving him some responsibility and, and asking him to help you. When you do that... Um, He's going to take that mantle of leadership, and he's probably not going to be a problem. I mean, that recipe worked for me over and over again when I was a teacher. Um, now, granted, I was a dude, and I coached football, and it's a little bit different dynamic. And I would agree with this, that you know, having that, that male role model, and I talk about this all the time, is extremely important. I tell this story also about these elephants. There was this... Um, there was this, and I heard this from a principal too, a guy that I really respect. He said that there was a village in Africa that was kind of, the surrounding areas had been ravaged by poachers. They were going after the the big full-grown elephants who had these big long tusks because the tusks were very valuable and they wanted their feet for ashtrays and all this cool, you know, terrible shit that they do with, with uh, I was going to say cruel, not cool, <laughs> with these elephants. Well, the end result was all the, the big mature male elephants were gone and, and, and the, the young elephants were just terrorizing the villages, going through and kicking shit over and, um, you know, killing people and taking down buildings and stealing food. And I mean, it's a big ass elephant. It's big and scary. And, you know, what are you going to do? You know, what can you do against an elephant, right? Aside from shooting it with a big ass gun. Um, and the solution was, the solution to the situation was to import mature elephants from a different part of Africa and bring them into the area and just assimilate them in with these younger, uh, with these adolescent age male elephants. And as soon as they brought in the, the grown up elephants, all that behavior stopped. There were, there were no more uh, people versus elephant issues. There was no more uh, houses being knocked down. There's more, no more food getting stolen, no more people getting killed. And having that strong male role model certainly uh, is is a, is a frame. It's a, it's a thing that, that teaches those young elephants what's acceptable and what isn't. You know, we're going to do this, but we're not going to do that. You know what I mean? And I think that when you have that kid in class who is the bad kid and causing problems, he needs a big full-grown male elephant to let him know what's going to be acceptable and what isn't. In a lot of cases, I mean, that's supposed to be your dad, right? It's supposed to be your dad, but a lot of these kids, they, they don't have it. And you know what? Whatever. I mean, what what can you do about that as a teacher? Really, nothing. Um, you know, I've I've talked and talked about how father how important fatherhood is, how great that is, and this is not at all a uh, you know an indictment against men, not at all, because I would tell you there are a fuck ton of factors about why those guys aren't there, and women have a lot of accountability in that too, or culpability in that as well. And I've written about that, and I've talked about it before as well. But this idea that we can we can systematically remove boyhood from from or manhood from boys to remove boyness from boys to remove manliness from men uh, it can't be done number one number two it's going to create these these victim pukes these ideas where you men just they have these ideas about the way the world is supposed to work and what their role is in that world and when they're not getting the things that they need to have when when the things they that come natural to them are being so restrained and so restricted and so punished, um, that energy is going to come out someplace bad. 93% of, of uh, prison inmates are male. Um, it's not, I mean, again, lots of factors there. You know, I'm big on, 
you own your own world. And, and these get these men, they made the decisions that put them there. There's no doubt about that. But it is a reflection of some things that are going on in our world. Society is not to blame. The system is not to blame. Schools are not to blame. Uh, but, you know, people who want to complain that there are no good men out there, yeah, maybe you can do your part. And I've got some ideas for you, right? I mean, that's kind of what we're talking about. So the importance of the whistle, all right? The ability to, uh, the practice of learning what that is, playing to the whistle, stopping at the whistle, being as, as, t as intense as you can and learning how to turn that off, it's a process. It doesn't just happen automatically. You need lots of things in there, people telling you, older role models teaching you to do it. You need lots of reps, lots of practice. You've got to take the time to develop that masculinity within you. Uh, the things that uh, make, you a, make you a boy or make you a man, you've got to have outlets for that. Um, know that other people sometimes aren't going to understand it and they don't need to. You don't need their permission or their approval. You find a place to, to, to polish that up and use it as you need to. And sharpen your tool. You know, get yourself to where you are uh, dangerous and thus not dangerous at all. You know what I mean? Uh, that's the idea. My name is Travis Neville. This is the Travis Neville Podcast. I wrote this book called The Jocelyn Method. You can get it all kinds of damn places. You can get it on my website, which is travisneville.com. Uh, I hope that in some way this show today helps you to get your shit together. Have a great week.